here we go. So I'm delighted now to join to introduce this evening's speaker, Joe Peccarelli. Uh, he's, a he's the Conservation Project Manager at ZSL, that's the Zoological Society of London, for people who, don't know, who are not aware of that. He's a board member of the Riverfly Partnership. He's a professional eel measurer, which sounds intriguing, and called co-developer of the Outfall Safari, which is a method of finding and reporting sources of pollution in urban rivers. He's also a trustee of the Friends of River Crane Environment, that's a tributary of the Thames in southwest London. So I'm going to hand you over to him now and he's going to talk to us about river fly monitoring in Greater London, working together to improve our rivers. Thank you. Over to you, Joe. Hi, thank you very much, Maria. And thank you so much for including me in your programme. I'm going to try and um, share my screen. Let's see how I, how I get on. Um, oh dear. One second. I, I was interested to see that um, poll that um, 45% said that they um, weren't interested, but uh, so I take that as a challenge. Am I showing my slides now? Yes, they're showing yeah. up. Now. That's good. Yeah. Lovely. OK, so, yeah, no, like I say, thank you so much for um, letting me um, join your programme and thank you everyone at home for uh, for joining me. Um, like I said, that was a really interesting poll at the beginning. 30% um, of you are already Riverfly uh, samplers, which is fantastic. 17% of you said that you would sign up afterwards. So um, we'll obviously be checking. Um, uh, I didn't, when, when um, I talked to Kieran about delivering this talk, I didn't quite know where to pitch it. So I've got sort of about half an hour. And for those of you that are already involved in Riverfly, it might be a bit of a recap of the sort of basics. But um, I want to talk about the scheme, how it works across London, and then think about what the constraints are, the kind of ecological constraints are on rivers in London. Um, and that's kind of it, and plenty of time for questions at the end, I hope. So, um, yeah, do, do bring those questions in. That would be fantastic. Um, so, yeah, so by way of backgrounds, um, the Riverfly Monitoring Initiative uh, is actually a, a project of the Riverfly Partnership. So the Riverfly Partnership is a national partnership of organisations involving... Uh, um, universities, conservation NGOs like the Zoological Society, myself, who I, who I work for rather, um, uh, angling groups, there's a big angling fraternity, and in fact, actually it's more commonly called the Anglers Riverfly Monitoring Initiative, but um, uh, we've sort of abbreviated it to the Riverfly Monitoring Initiative primarily because in London we don't, don't get too many anglers. Uh, but the aim of the partnership is to protect uh, water quality of rivers, uh, to further the understanding of riverfly populations and conserve riverfly habitats. And the monitoring is funded by the Environment Agency and the money comes from rod license sales. So um, it's quite leanly funded. So just at the, at the core of the, of the River Monitoring Initiative, the RMI, there's just one very busy person and one helper running it across the whole country. So, um, you know, with that small core, it's become the, the best established and most widely um, uh, used um, citizen science methods uh, in the UK and uh, for monitoring the health of our rivers. And the scheme I'm gonna be telling you about is, um, based on long, long standing principles of measuring the water quality of rivers. And that's to say it's biotic assessment. So using the life in rivers to give us an indication of the health in, in rivers. And the good thing about using invertebrates uh, as your indicator is that they're ubiquitous. So they occur all over the place and there are many species and they have different uh, sensitivities to pollution. So if you have a water body with only oligokete worms and coronamids, as shown on the slide, which are robust and will survive in pretty much any environment, 
Uh, if you've only got those, you know you've got a pretty polluted water body. Whereas if you've got plenty of stonefly and, and flat body mayfly and the other creatures shown there, then you know that you've got fairly healthy or very healthy uh, conditions because they will only tolerate uh, water without pollution. And when I'm talking about pollution here, it's really organic pollution. So nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, those are the principal um, pollutants that this scheme is based on. Um, so sewage is the big source of that. Um, so the scheme is essentially based on, I'm going to be talking you through this, and it's based on sort of three steps, really. There's the sampling, which is, is, is kicking. There's counting, counting your bugs, which you, and you derive a score from the counting, and then collaboration. So kicking, counting, and collaboration. And I'm going to talk you through that process now. And with apologies to those of you that know this very well, because you're out once a month on your own rivers. But essentially, so the sampling is, is a standard method. As I said, this is based on long-standing principles of measuring the health of rivers. So it's standardized in two ways. Firstly, the net we use, the kick net, which shown there in the picture is a standard size and uh, the timing of the kick. So it's three minutes kick sampling. And then because some larger stones don't get lifted in kick sampling, then you do a hand search, so you lift stones, you lift logs, whatever's in your stretch of river, uh, and you brush them off into your sample. So it's a kind of super, supermarket sweep type mentality. You've got three minutes to try and collect all the invertebrates in your section of river. And the important thing is you're going back to the same site to, uh, um, each time you sample. So that's the, 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 the kicking. The next stage is to perfect the art of staring with intellectual seriousness into a white plastic tray because that contains your invertebrates. And the Riverfly scheme is based on eight invertebrate groups or so eight um, target groups that we count uh, and we derive a score from. And the good news is, is that we don't have to count each and every one of them. Um, you, you're, you're, it's rough counts because the um, scoring of the sample is based on a logarithmic scale. So what I mean by that is that we include shrimps in this sample, freshwater shrimps, and they get they get scored one point if you've got between zero and ten, or sorry, one to ten shrimp, two points for ten to a hundred, and so on. So it, it's approximate scores, uh, approximate counts. Sorry, because it's it's a citizen science method. It's designed to be quick and easy to use, but also robust, very importantly, which it is. So here are the eight key invertebrate groups for those keen entomologists amongst you. I fear you might be disappointed because I'm not going to go too much uh, into the um, invertebrates, but uh, so enjoy them while you can. Here they are, the eight groups that we incorporate in the scheme. And as I say, we, 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 we derive a score from their presence and their uh, estimated number or, or counted number. And then the important bit is the, the collaboration bit. So this is the collaboration with the environment agency. And what this, what this means is at the beginning of starting your invertebrates, uh, your river fly monitoring, sorry, uh, your site that you're monitoring is given uh, a, a trigger level. It's called a trigger level, which is the minimum accepted, acceptable score um, for your samples. So if your score drops below your trigger level, uh, pollution has occurred at your site, and then you call in to the Environment Agency. So don't forget that the Environment Agency fund this scheme. And what it does is it gives them all these eyes out on the river, uh, these trained citizen scientists, once a month gathering this information. And when they uh, when the trigger level is breached, they can be sure that that's a, or, or they suspect that's a pollution event. And then they can go in uh, and follow up and gather more evidence. So that's the that's the scheme in a nutshell. Um, and it's since it was launched in 2007. Uh, it's grown year on year and now 2600 volunteers are involved across the UK, the UK. You can see the dots on map. On the map represents the um, sites, 1,850 sites nationwide, 120 RMI groups. And because it's become so big and it's still coordinated so leanly with just one very busy chap and a helper, 
uh, it's uh, developed a, an infrastructure of its own. So there's 45 hubs. So these are regional groups that coordinate multiple RMI schemes in their area. And that's why I'm talking to you about um, the London hub, because the Zoological Society of London, who I work for, are coordinators of the London hub. And we do this in partnership with the organisations on the slide there, Thames 21, South East Rivers Trust, Land of the Fans, and very importantly, with the Environment Agency. Since the uh, RMA, RMI started in London, so 2008 was the first scheme, we now have nine rivers that have active schemes on them. There's, there's room for more, so hopefully there'll be people uh, listening tonight that will sign up and join us. Um, but as hub coordinators, our responsibility is to provide training. So um, when COVID uh, isn't forcing us to stay at home, we normally run uh, at least two training sessions a year. Uh, we provide support to Riverfly groups. So support may, might mean um, guidance on fundraising, what kit to use, that sort of thing, um, identification. And probably our most important role is uh, sharing data and liaison with the Environment Agency. Uh, and that happens principally once a year through a meeting where we pull together the Riverfly groups uh, and the Environment Agency staff who, are, staff who are involved in monitoring our rivers themselves, of course, uh, for regulatory purposes. So together, it's about synerg synergy with the regulator. Um, that's the point. Um, so just I'll take you through some of the things that um, have been happening within the London hub. And of course, as I said at the beginning, just to reinforce essentially that it's about primarily about pollution detection. It's training uh, volunteers to become citizen scientists who are equipped with a robust method for detecting pollution in our rivers. And you can see here's an example, this is the River Crane in West London. You don't particularly need to be an RMI volunteer to see that that is polluted, but you know, it gives us that robust evidence. You can see on the chart there, the scores generally hovering between four and seven or so. And then at the time of this pollution event, it's just dropped down to um, um, below the trigger level being three at this site. Uh, and of course, once that happens, happens we call it into the Environment Agency uh, National Polluting Report, Pollution Reporting Hotline, which is 0800 80 70 60, which is a number I hope you've all got on, on, on you as you um, travel around your nearest river, because it's not just for RMI volunteers, it's for anyone who spots pollution, they can use that number to call it in. Uh, but when we call in the number, we, we give them the evidence that we've gathered, or rather the, the, the volunteers give them the evidence that have been gathered, and they say it's, uh, it's a pollution event recorded by a RMI volunteer, um, and then it can be followed up. So that's the primary purpose. But of course, there's all these added um, benefits of the Riverfly monitoring scheme that those of you that are involved in one will know full well. Um, Firstly, if you have multiple sites in a river and the red dots on the map there, that's the River Wandle, um, it becomes a very powerful tool for gathering information across a whole river catchment in order to inform catchment management. And what I mean by that is you can see through the invertebrate counts where you've got organic pollution problems. In this instance, the example is upstream and downstream of a sewage treatment works, but it might be other inputs of uh, of pollution that are causing problems to your river fly, uh, um, your, your, your invertebrate communities. So you get spatial data, you get uh, long-term trends in the health of the river, um, um, of course, because you're accumulating a lot of data once a month, hopefully over many years. Uh, and this is becoming increasingly important as the Environment Agency's funding is under increasing pressure, unfortunately, so they're having to think of more clever ways to, to, to work with communities uh, together to monitor our uh, environment. And the RMI is one very established way of doing this. And also then there's all these soft targets that the river fly monitoring is so good for. It's about spreading awareness. It's about getting out there once a month, isn't it? And meeting local uh, uh, people who show a great interest in their rivers. In my own river fly sites, uh, it's in a public park and we have to occasionally battle off dogs who want to get involved in the science uh, and uh, drink from our samples. But we also get families who come down and they might it might be the first time that they realise there's a local friends of group 
or a group who are interested in the river, it might be that starting point for them to get involved in helping their local environment, um, which, although hard to quantify, is just so important. And also, of course, if you've got this multiple uh, uh, sites across your catchments, um, you can build other citizen science methodologies uh, into what they do. And one example, and Maria mentioned this at the beginning, um, um, uh, when she was introducing me, is the outfall safari. So this is a, a means by which we can uh, map pollution sources in urban rivers. Um, so sadly, there are um, uh, connections um, in urban rivers between the foul drainage system uh, and the surface water drains, and that manifests itself as pollution in outfalls. So this method is a way of, of doing a whole catchment survey uh, and we run them across rivers. We've got into a situation now where we're, we're trying to run them once every four years on every river in Greater London. So look out, if you haven't been involved in an outfall safari yet, you're, you're in for a treat. Um, so anyway, let's get back to uh, invertebrates and think about um, what should are on invertebrate communities in rivers in London. And also um, with this starting slide sort of highlight why we should be concerned about them, why they're important. You know, they are at the base of the food chain in the blue green corridors that bisects London. There's 600 kilometers or so of, of, uh, of rivers across London. And they link, it's not just about the biodiversity, the wildlife of the rivers themselves. They link, of course, to the riparian environments and the bats and the birds that live along them. So that base of the food ch chain, very important for biodiversity of our rivers. And, um, this is where we come into, and um, I'm very excited about this. I've not done this before, and Kieran um, is going to help me with this because um, he's technically minded. Um, but we've got a river invertebrate quiz. Uh, the first challenge is to think of a better name for a river invertebrate quiz, which you can do in the chat. Uh, but we've got two questions for you. Um, uh, just to think about sort of invertebrates in London and the diversity. The first one, um, and I'm thinking specifically of a, 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 there's a paper that was done um, in the London Naturalist in the, in the year 2004, I think it was published, um, which reviewed all the invertebrate data across London. And it came up for a, a, with a figure for the total number of invertebrates taxa in London. Kieran, have you got the, have you got the question that you can flash up in some magical, whoa, look at that, magnificent. So um, yeah, how many invert, micro invertebrate taxa, macro invertebrate, sorry, taxa have been recorded in Greater London. Everyone's going for the big number. I did say to Maria and, and everyone on, on the call at the start that we wouldn't be leaving until you all get this correct. So um, we'll just hang on a bit. We'll give it another few seconds. Um, that's pretty damn good. So yeah, 45% of you are correct. 310 um, uh, invertebrate taxa. So, so well done. I'm dealing with a, a knowledgeable audience, so I better up my game. That's fantastic. Uh, the next question is, so in that paper, um, uh, this review paper, they recorded a range from nine to 127 different taxa in individual rivers. So the next question is, out of these four rivers in London, which do you think recorded the greatest diversity. This is gonna, te gonna test those people that are not from London. Um, so we've got the Wandle, the Darrant, the Colne and the Brent. Not many going for the Brent um, and you're probably quite right. Very good, let's, let's stop it there, that's brilliant. You, because Let's stop it when the Colne was in the lead because that's correct, it is the Colne. And many people have said the Wandle too and that's mu a much improved river but essentially the pressures are related to urbanization and the coal is right on the sort of periphery of greater London and probably subjected to less intense urban pressure and therefore has greater diversity. The kind of equation is as simple as that. And as we, we're gonna go through the next 10 minutes and look at some of those pressures on our um, invertebrate communities, I just wanna say thank you, Kieran. Um, that was great and it worked really well. So um, uh, brilliant. Um, and now I've forgotten how to um, there take my slides forward. Um, so let's think about yeah invertebrate communities in London. So I'm, apologies, the, the, the figures are slight, the numbers are slightly small on this, but this is these are the mean RMI scores for rivers in London, and you can probably see that it ranges in London between 
So these are annual means. Uh, between one and 10, there are some sites on the Wandle that do score quite well. There's one, there's a site there that scores 10. There's an average of about five uh, in London. And if we compare this to a kind of typical um, um, semi-impacted, if I can put it that way, river, rural river, they probably score between 10 to 18. Maximum score is 32, uh, which is never achieved. Uh, but an unimpacted chalk stream might be about 16 to 22. So we can see our urban rivers are degraded. And in terms of um, river fly or invertebrate assemblages are impoverished. Um, um, and that it might be surprising to some of you that actually um, those are the scores in the present time but actually that they have improved. Invertebrate communities have improved over the last 30 years. And we did a piece of work, or I didn't, um, a very uh, capable master's student from Imperial did a piece of work analyzing uh, invertebrate data over the last 30 years. This is Environment Agency invertebrate data. And they found a general improvement in most rivers, the Colne, the Crane, you can see there, the Ingleborn, Sadly, only the Brent is in decline. And these, these uh, WHPT and ASPT, they're different ways of measuring the same thing, essentially, using invertebrates to, to look at the, the quality of the river environment. So we've got a degraded environment, and yet uh, things are improving. So what now might be the constraints around the health of our rivers and the biodiversity of our rivers? Well, I think there's a clue here. This is data that's um, hot off the press, actually, in a report that we're just um, uh, just writing. Uh, we put SONs, they're called. So these are water quality sensors in a river, and they send out data every 15 minutes, real-time information, amazing bits of kit. And we put one of these in the river crane or a tributary of the crane. And you can see the spikes that you can see there are ammonium. This, this chart is showing us ammonium over time. And what's happening here is that when there's rainfall, you get spikes so over five milligrams per litre, that's ecologically damaging. So the water framework directive classification for ammonium, if you're up above two, you're in the poor classification. And maybe we'll talk about the water framework directive later if we have to, but of course that's the way we regulate the water environment. Uh, in the UK. And what ammonia does is it directly damages animals at that level, but it will also cause um, a, a spike in biological oxygen demand. So oxygen will drop uh, and animal communities will be affected by this. So I suspect that's a big constraint and there are a number of, numbers of papers to suggest that that is the case. It's not the only pollution that's affecting rivers. Um, road runoff provides metals and hydrocarbons that um, essentially we don't really know the impact. We know they bioaccumulate and we know there's human health concerns, uh, but we don't fully understand, particularly when there's a cocktail of chemicals affecting our rivers. Pesticides too, thought of as a, perhaps a rural problem, but they're also a problem in urban rivers through pet treatments, pesticides used in gardens, they end up in our waterways. But of course, it's not just about water quality. Um, Quantity too is the obvious one. You know, um, we're living in a very stressed area, Southeast England, and population uh, uh, increase and climate change is only going to exacerbate a very difficult situation. This picture is of the Wandle, which you might not know, the flow through the Karlshalton arm is augmented by pumps, um, uh, which are controlled by Sutton and something, Surrey water. Um, but of course the pumps failed in this image and there we are, that's the natural base flow through the aquifer in, in the Wandle, which is a chalk stream. And this, is, this problem is not uh, particular just to the Wandle, all the rivers that flow through South London are chalk streams, so they're dependent on full aquifers. Ravensbourne is ultimately a chalk stream at, at source. So um, they're all dependent on, on full aquifers, which are under pressure from abstraction. Habitat too, this is an extreme example, but sadly not that uncommon. You know, you need a good heterogeneous um, habitat or, or, or mosaic of different habitats to support an abundance of wildlife and abundance of invertebrates. Um, and um, sediment is a particular problem as well. 
So sediment uh, that washes off roads and other hard surfaces in the city bring, is bound up with all those pollutants I mentioned before, metals and hydrocarbons. Uh, and they collect within the sediments of rivers, reducing their capacity rich and varied invertebrate communities. So these are two other big issues that are constraining our invertebrate communities. So one thing that the, um, the RMI doesn't do, uh, and that is record the distribution of rare species. Um, you know, it's, it sticks to those eight key groups. Um, and, and, it's some, and it's an area that we know we're lacking and we really want to do something about it. And I was talking to Kieran early and he was saying that there's an advert out there uh, for a river fly co uh, recorder rather, river fly recorder for the London Natural History Society. Uh, and um, it, it's, a, it's a prize job. So I'm sure there'll be an orderly queue at the end of this talk. Um, if you're interested in, in, in gathering um, river fly records and particularly of um, uh, key species, for example, the ditch dun shown on the slide here was last recorded in the Dollis Brook, which is a tributary of the Brent in the 90s, and it hasn't been seen since. As the river fly recorder, you may well get an opportunity to record this for the first time in the year. So just, just think about that opportunity and maybe we can talk about that uh, later. I want to finish on a positive note because what's been happening over the last 30 years or 20 years rather is that rivers are being restored. So 39 kilometers in London, that is 39 kilometers of river have been restored. That's 6.5% of the total length of rivers. And you can see the chart shows that uh, cumulative total increasing, obviously, uh, over time. And that's thanks to fantastic organizations like the Southeast Rivers Trust working on south of the Thames and Thames 21 working north of the Thames to help make that happen. But it requires communities to drive those improvements and to show interest and support that. And one of the wonderful things is that the River Fly monitoring rec uh, records um, those restoration projects. So I've got some examples here, sadly not from London. This is on the River Rib. Uh, the implementation shown in that chart is uh, concerning the removal of a weir. Uh, and you can see for 28 weeks before the removal, it's the site scores four or five in the RMI scoring. Remember, which is a direct representation of the diversity and abundance of invertebrates. And within 29 weeks of that weir being removed, it's right up to above 15. So you know, it just shows that biodiversity can be hugely enhanced by restoring rivers. Another example here, this is the River Bullborn. Weir removal imme immediately showed an uplift in, in, in invertebrate diversity, which of course affects all those other animals, the bats and the birds. And then further habitat improvement had another uplift. Um, so if we can get the water quality right and we can get the habitat right, we can bring really diverse, rich rivers to the heart of London but they need to be monitored and they need to be cared for. And that's why I'm kind of asking for more volunteers. We need more volunteers, not just ZSL who coordinate the scheme on the crane, but all the other schemes in London on the Ravensbourne, the Wandle, they all need volunteers. They all need people who care. So um, um, not that those who don't volunteer don't care, but we need more volunteers basically, that's what I'm saying. I've, there's some because these slides I think are going to be online for a while. There's some links there for further reading. Really nice demonstration of kick sampling on the FSC site. Um, there's our site. If you want to sign up as a volunteer, that's the link for us. Bug Life, Life have got some terrific resources uh, for uh, river flies, and I want to say thanks to Brian Knight, Ben Fitch, Steve Brooks who've helped with this, and also of course to our wonderful volunteers who join us every year and uh, who are out on rivers once a month sampling them. Um, fantastic. And these are the people that fund uh, the River Fly scheme across London, City Bridge Trust and Thames Water. So thank you so much for listening. I hope I didn't overrun and I'd really like the opportunity to, to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Joe. That was really fantastic. It was there was it was nice to see some positive um, a kind of improvements as well, so that you know where things can make a difference. I think that was a nice note to end on, uh, and I liked the kind of little thing you know remember way to remember the kicking, counting, and collaborate. I thought that was really kind of useful. A little mnemonic. Um, 
what we're going to do now is we're going to have a we're going to have some time to ask questions so, so that's brilliant um, and thanks joe for offering to kind of answer to answer those we're going to have a combination because we have time or people can ask some questions in person so if you'd like to do that please put up your virtual hand and then we'll pick you up and we'll let you speak to joe directly we'll also take some questions from the chat as well i've seen it's been quite busy during the course of the talk um, I'm going to ask David to pick up some of the questions out of the chat. So if we go straight over to the chat, first of all, David, is, is that OK? Um, but do do put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question, because we, you know, if that's that's nice. That makes it kind of a bit more interactive. So um, do you want to start off with? Yeah, um, well, there, was, there were a few questions um, people asked about how they could find out whether there's a scheme near them if, if they're not in London. Um, particularly questions about Scotland and whether there's anything similar in Ireland but more generally people want to know if there's stuff in their areas how do they find out? Uh, thank you yeah so um, so in London um, uh, I included on my slides the ZSL web page it's basically a landing page and it links to all the rivers where there are schemes and who's coordinating them so um, you, you know you can go through that page to find out whether it's Southeast Rivers Trust 1021 or, or ZSL basically, or, or other. Um, if you're not sure, then just drop me an email. My, my email is on there on the slides. In terms of um, nationally, then go on to the Riverfly Partnerships web webpage. Um, again, the, the link is on the slides and you should be able to see your local scheme. There isn't coverage in some areas of Scotland. So if someone's particularly asking from Scotland, they might be disappointed or they might just have to start a scheme themselves. Give it a go. So that's always an opportunity. So yeah. you know, they're obviously, the, you know, they can see that some areas are much better covered than others. And that was kind of very obvious in the map, but um, you know, I'm sure, and I'm sure Joe, there's a lot of support and guidance and help for somebody who, you know, is, is kind of able to and interested in taking that forward. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to a couple of people who are going to ask questions in person now. So um, we'll start off with Liz. Would you like to unmute yourself, Liz, and ask your question? I'm afraid this is Liz's husband, Kennedy. Oh, I'm hi, Kennedy. Kennedy. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask uh, just the latter data. Uh, why are weirs uh, associated with poor? Um, That's a great question from you and your canine friend. Uh, thank you very much. Was it Kennedy? Yes, it is. Kennedy. Yeah, so what happens with weirs is um, they, uh, they, they cause impoundment. So the water backs up behind them. And by doing so, it, the energy is taken out of the flow and they just drop sediment. So you get accumulation of sediment behind a weir. And where there's thick sediment that accumulates, you get lower oxygen levels. You get poorer environments for um, uh, invertebrates that need highly oxygenated water and biodiversity will slowly decline. And as that slide shows, as soon as you remove that weir and you restore natural function, that's when your biodiversity picks up again. So there's actually quite a, um, a, a busy program, I'd say, across the UK, particularly spearheaded by the Rivers Trusts, to remove weirs that aren't needed. You know, obviously some of them are needed for navigation um, and for uh, flood control reasons, but where they're not needed, um, it's best for wildlife and our rivers if they're removed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Your dog obviously liked the answer as well. <laughs> that was a good contribution. Okay, we're gonna go next to Jeffrey Easterway. If you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello. Thank you very much, Joe. Very interesting talk. I am uh, trying to establish uh, uh, Riverfly monitoring in County Cork, so I'm fascinated to hear, you know, what you have to say. Uh, and in the early forays we've had down onto um, our local rivers, we have appear to have had a, a good, uh, uh, quite a good range of, of, in, uh, of the good guy invertebrates. I know mayflies, regrettably, but uh, blue-winged olives, het and caddis and caseless caddis, and et cetera, with the odd baddie, Acellus, I believe. But even though we've had, you know, 
a reasonable range in relatively smallish numbers in three minutes. We uh, On the last sweep, we had 511 freshwater shrimps. I wonder what that tells us about our, our river. It just seems an extraordinary uh, huge number. Well, um, actually, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, on even on our um, rivers with you know urban sites, you can get five, six hundred gamorous. They can occur in huge number. You know, chalk streams, you'll get over a thousand gamorous in a in a in a single sample. Um, so yeah, be prepared for abundance, and obviously, abundance is a, is a very good sign. Um, um, I, just to sort of point out that, that we have, um, you know, this, this scale um, of, of that we use for biotic assessment of a river where you've got the really robust things, the, the, the oligochaetes and the chronomids, it's not, um, they will also occur in a clean river, in particular sort of microhabitats. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you, you shouldn't, you wouldn't expect to get them, you'll get that diversity of species, but in a healthy river, they're in balance and in proportion. In a damaged, polluted river, that's when your acellus um, will take off and you'll, they'll proliferate and they'll become more numerous than other species. But you're saying you're saying shrimp are not bad guys. They're, they're quite good, really. Well, they're very no, good. It's, it's a wonderful sign to have 500 shrimp. And I mean, that's, you know, this scheme could almost work just on shrimp because the great thing about them is they are in almost every uh, river in the UK. In fact, probably every, I, I imagine. And their number, then the fluctuation in their numbers will tell you about whether the river's polluted or not. So to record the actual numbers is a very helpful uh, thing to do as well. Uh, and celebrating the abundance, that's great. Good to hear. And good for you starting a scheme in County Cork. I'm very pleased to hear it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Yeah, thank you, Geoffrey. It's really nice to know, you know, when kind of people are involved in different things. And also that's helpful as well, Joe, to get the idea it's about the balance. So you don't really have anything that's bad. It's like, but you want the kind of range and not the restriction to just a few groups. Okay, we're going to go to Rebecca Lewis next. So would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi there. Um, thanks very much. Really interesting talk. Um, I coordinate a riverfly project in Midlothian, um, currently with 20 volunteers waiting for this pandemic to uh, settle so we can get trained. But I just wondered, is there a national standard for setting a trigger level across the UK? Oh, thank you, Rebecca. Um, firstly, for your kind words about the talk. Um, that's a really good question and it's the stuff of much discussion at the Riverfly Partnerships board meeting meetings because um, the, the trigger level setting is obviously done locally with so with your local uh, in your case SEPA uh, contact so and they each interpret the process slightly differently. Um, I can send you the guidelines for um, how the Riverfly Partnership recommend it's done, which is basically, I think, looking back over six months of data from the same site or a comparable site within the river. Um, there, are, there are guidelines that are developed by the Riverfly Partnership, but they're not always applied uh, in every instance. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yeah, I, 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 I was wondering if that was the case, but yeah, we'd really good to see um the guidelines i just haven't come across anything that's been standardized so i'll be really keen to have a look thank you are you okay to drop me an email yeah absolutely i was just okay. looking for you on the under the under there but yes i will do thank you thank you um david can we go to a couple of questions in the chat now because i can see that's been quite busy as well and there's a couple of got yeah I've, I've got a couple lined up so what one one was from uh dr sorry the page also, Dr. Sagley, who just asked about what are the physical limitations on the rivers you study? You obviously have to be able to walk in them, but are there minimum, maximum widths and flow rates and such like that you need to worry about? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good question. Probably something I should have stressed because obviously the primary consideration um, is safety of the individuals involved. So, um, you know, that it's this is an appropriate method method for rivers that are routinely. Um, in, in normal flows are shallow enough to get in in a pair of welly boots. So there are there are risk considerations that are primary. And in terms of um, habitats, this um, scheme is designed for gravel beds. Basically, you know, you, you, you won't you won't be able to use this in a sort of slow flowing 
heavily silted river. Uh, it's for uh, free flowing, clean graveled or, or gravel bed rivers. Okay, thank you. Um, and one other I'll, I'll ask, because um, this struck me as interesting when, when the person asked it, given how quickly you're showing some effects in some of your charts. So uh, Angela asked, um, given the COVID, current COVID restrictions and our inability to record at the moment, how much of an effect on longer term monitoring will that have? An effect on monitoring? Well, I mean, it's just, I share everyone's frustration. I mean, we're just going to have two, two years possible, well, hopefully not two years, but certainly a year, a year's lack of data. I mean, I think when, when we can all get back out there, there's going to be a frenzy of monitoring. <laughs> So it's going to be a lot of a lot of data, but I think the important thing is is that you know it's the um, it's that um, routine, the uh, the systematic way that the river fly monitoring is done. That's what's important. So it, to have a short gap is not a huge problem because you can, as long as you're going back to the same site, you pick it up when you can, when COVID allows, and you have that long term data set. Thank you. And, then, and fingers crossed, it's not going to be too much longer before we manage to get back to monitoring. So let, let's, let's hope. Um, just I'm going to go to the, the question some, uh, to Katrina in a second. But there's a couple of other people who have said that trigger that trigger information. Is that possible to make that more widely available, like to at least to people who are involved in the project? Because I think there seems to be other people that would like to have that information, too. Yeah. Is there, is there a way that I can send when you upload the slides or whatever you do with these slides afterwards maybe I could include a link to the protocol yeah. or we, we can talk about yeah, it but yeah we can yeah. find a way of doing yeah. it yeah. yeah so we'll find a way of doing it if that but if in theory that's possible that would be great okay so I'm going to go over now to Katrina thanks for waiting so patiently if you um, I'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question hi hi Joe it's uh, Kat here um, I was just uh, quite surprised that you said that one of the, talking about tri trigger levels, you said that one of the rivers was, um, the trigger levels were three, which seems remarkably low. Does that mean that, that river tolerates a certain amount of pollution that um, others wouldn't be tolerated elsewhere? Hello, Kat. Very nice oh. to hear from you. <laughs> and thank you for joining us. Um, I keep on... Um, it is it is low, and in fact, actually, you've 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 hit on a, a an area of development in the Riverfly partnership in that um, it was never really intended. Um, well, the, the the scheme was developed on cleaner rivers, essentially, so trigger levels really shouldn't be set that low. Um, but some rivers in London, sadly, are in that degraded state, and right. so what we've what we've done is um, we've developed an urban specific river fly. I've got, you can probably just see on the screen there, I've got it in my hand. So it's, it's a more extended yeah. scheme. It involves 14 groups. And essentially this scheme is for use where trigger levels need to be set less than five. Oh, right. um, so it's more um, responsive to pollution events. That's what it means. So yeah. we developed this, we were, we were about to launch it in, April last year, <laughs> bad timing. So um, it's, it's going to be out there and yeah. it will be helpful at tackling those problem sites where trigger levels have to be set really low. Okay, thanks. Thanks, thank you for your question, good one. Thank you again, that was another, inter yeah, it was another interesting question. Um, I, we, we haven't got anyone else with their hand up at the moment, but there's still time if one or two people would like to ask in person. David, can we pick up a couple more? Because I can see there's some, some fantastic yeah. pollution uh, levels. And yeah, there, there, there's a couple of pollution questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask them both and see if, see if Joe can smoothly combine them into one answer. Um, so so Bill, Bill Millard asked, um, in general, what is more damaging, organic pollution or principally road runoff? Um, and, and, and Janos Foldy asked, given you mentioned ammonia increase after rainfall, is there a big impact of salting in, in winter on the rivers and invertebrates? Well, firstly, hello, Bill. It's very nice to hear from you. I hope you're keeping well. Um, I've got, we've got half the Hogsmill uh, volunteers, I think, on the call, which is, <laughs> which is absolutely wonderful. They are a dedicated uh, team. Um, so the question was around um, 
what was the bigger impact? Is that right, David? Between um, yeah, the, uh, ammonia and the, the road runoff. Between so orga yeah, well, yeah, organic pollution or road runoff. Yeah, well, there's been there's been some papers that have come out recently that suggests that um, ammonia spikes are the kind of principal constraint on um, invertebrate communities. So it's not saying that that's the most important, but that's probably what's defining the abundance and diversity of um, rivers that are impacted by combined sewer overflows or inputs of, of sewage on a regular basis. That's probably the constraint. Um, the thing is about that is it can, it's, it's probably easier to solve. So the metals that are accumulating in our rivers are an equally important problem to tackle the, the hydrocarbons. We really need to get to grips um, with this issue too, not least because um, there are human health considerations about allowing these things to accumulate in surface waters. Um, so the principal ecological constraint is probably ammonia. Um, <clears throat> the second question about salt is a really interesting one. And yes, it is a problem um, uh, in winter that, uh, when roads are salted, it does end up everything off roads, everything off hard surfaces generally ends up in rivers. Um, and if it's in high enough concentration, it will have an ecological impact, salted roads going into rivers. Um, actually, um, <clears throat> the particularly damaging scenario from, from roads is what happens in summers when we get long, hot summers, no rainfall for a period and an accumulation of, all, of material on a road and then a heavy downpour. That's the sort of scenario that causes fish kills and invertebrate kills in uh, urban rivers. And it happens every year in London. And we do have the strategies to deal with it. It's just we're going to require investment um, to, to properly get to grips with it. Yeah, and that's often the kind of constraint, isn't it, that there are solutions, but the, the kind of financing and the sometimes the will to, to kind of do these things, it's take that can take kind of a lot of time and effort before people's ideas start to shift. We've got time maybe for just one very quick last question, if there's something, David. Um, well, I'll ask one that hopefully will let us end on, on an optimistic note. Yeah. I'm not sure it's a quick question, but um, Mary asked, um, apart from improving water quality, are there other positive things that can be done to improve the environment for river flies and other bugs? Yeah, good good question. Was it Mary who said that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so join a, join a, your local uh, rivers trust and get involved in the sort of habitat improvement works that they get involved with, the restoration works, because as I hope I showed in my slides, there's a direct link between habitat complexity and habitat richness and biodiversity in a river. So that's a good note to end on. We can, we can do things about our biologically impoverished rivers. Great, that is a very nice way to, to round off, Joe. Thank you very much. What, I think you did put your email so that people could get in touch with you if they would like to kind of follow up. Is that? I, yeah, I put, I, put, you at I, least? Put, I put my email and I also put Kieran's email to, 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 to form an orderly queue for a river fly cord uh, yeah, uh, recorder. That, <laughs> that will be particularly pleasing if we manage to recruit yeah. somebody. LHS as well. Thank you. So thank yeah. you so much for a really great talk. I, there's a lot of nice positive messages coming through in the chat, people thanking you. And I think it was not, we've had an interesting mix of people who already know something about this project, but also there's quite a few people this is completely new to. So I think it's it's been a, an audience and they've both been engaged in it. So thank you ever so much for that.